Thank you. It's so good to see such a, a hall full of lovely people. His Excellency Nestor Mendez, the Assistant Secretary General of the OAS, permanent representatives and observers, other members of the diplomatic corps, Dr. Sheila Walker, ladies and gentlemen, civil society and other representatives. A pleasant good afternoon to one and all and welcome to this afternoon's premiere screening of Familiar Faces, Unexpected Places, a Global African Diaspora. This is a documentary by Dr. Sheila Walker, who's a cultural anthropologist and executive director of AfroPro Inc. Actually, I wanted to say the well-known Dr. Sheila Walker, because her name precedes her. The film highlights the legacy and contributions of peoples of African descent, and today's event is being held in recognition of the International Decade for People of African Descent, and it is a joint initiative jointly organized by the Office of the OAS Assistant Secretary General and the UN Department of Public Information under the mandate from the UN's department, and this mandate is about the Remember Slavery Program and Afro Diaspora Inc. Today's screening will be followed by a panel discussion with representatives of the National Museum of African American History and Culture, the OAS, and the UN. And to do the honors of moderating for us will be the OAS Secretary for Access to Rights and Equity, Mauricio Ranz. Upon your arrival, you would have noticed an exhibit in the Hall of Heroes downstairs, outside rather, Remember Slavery, Recognition, Justice, and Development, which was produced by the United Nations in remembrance of the transatlantic slave trade. Please be sure to take a good look at the displays and reflect thereon. Without further ado, I'm very pleased at this moment to open today's event by welcoming Ambassador Nestor Mendez, the Assistant Secretary General of the OAS, who will give the opening remarks. And by the way, my name is Ian Edwards, and I'll be your Master of Ceremonies for the rest of today. Ambassador Mendez. Thank you very much, Ian. As usual, a very prominent voice in OS events. <clears throat> Reminds me of those very famous broadcasters that you listen to their voices and then you know something important is happening. Thank you very much. Señoras y señores, muy buenas tardes. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome to the Hall of the Americas. Ambassadors and delegates, Dr. Sheila Walker, cultural anthropologist and executive director of Afro Diaspora Inc. Members of civil society, special guests, ladies and gentlemen, señoras y señores, amigos y amigas. It is my distinct honor to participate today in the premier screening of Familiar Faces, Unexpected Places, a Global African Diaspora, a documentary by Dr. Sheila Walker. This documentary showcases the resolute spirit of the African diaspora to thrive regardless of the circumstances. As we celebrate the strength, resilience, persistence, and adaptability of Afro-descendants, in this decade for people of African descent, the OAS is honored to highlight the African diasporic experience here in the Americas. Afro-descendants are in every single country of our hemisphere and have impacted our societies in innumerable ways. They have contributed to many of our culinary delights by introducing foods such as okra, Kimbombo or gombo in Latin America. Those from the Caribbean will recognize callaloo, fish cakes, salt fish, aki, pudding, and of course, mangoes and plantains, just to name a few. Our African ancestors also influenced religion and spirituality in our region through religious practices such as voodoo in Haiti, shango in Trinidad and Tobago, Venezuela, and Brazil. Santeria in Cuba and Puerto Rico, and Umbanda, Macunda, and others again in Brazil. 
There are approximately 200 million people of African descent in the Americas. Yet despite comprising one third of the region's population and playing an instrumental role in shaping the social, economic, political, and cultural spheres of our societies, Afro-descendants continue to be one of the most vulnerable groups in this hemisphere. Fortunately, international public law provides several instruments to fight racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia, and intolerance. At the universal level, the United Nations has made substantial efforts to combat these scourges. At the inter-American level, a number of mechanisms have also been created to tackle this phenomenon and encourage respect for the rights of people of African descent in the Americas. In 2013, the OS General Assembly adopted the Inter-American Convention Against Racism, Racial Discrimination, and Related Intolerance, and the Inter-American Convention Against All Forms of Discrimination and Intolerance, which was the first legally binding instrument to condemn discrimination by reason of nationality, age, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity and expression, language, religion, and cultural identity. As of today, the Inter-American Convention Against Racism, Racial Discrimination, and Related Intolerance has been signed by 12 countries and ratified by Costa Rica and Uruguay. The convention will enter into force for those two countries on the 11th of November of this year, corresponding to the 30th day following the date on which the second instrument of ratification was deposited. The Inter-American Convention Against All Forms of Discrimination and Intolerance was also adopted by the OAS General Assembly in June 2013 and has been signed by 10 countries. We urge member states to ratify both instruments, wherein a minimum of 10 states parties is needed to convene the follow-up mechanism to review progress in their implementation. In 2014, through the resolution Recognition of the International Decade for, Peoples, for Persons of African Descent, the OAS General Assembly also recognized and stated its support for the International Decade for People of African Descent as proclaimed by the United Nations. Again, in 2016, the General Assembly adopted the Plan of Action for the Decade for Persons of African Descent in the Americas which marks to date the strongest commitment from this organization to African descendants in the Americas. The implementation of this plan will be executed and monitored through the Secretariat for Access to Rights and Equity, which will coordinate its activities and collaborate with other bodies of the inter-American system. Through this resolution and its subsequent plan of action, OS member states have shown their commitment to gradually adopting and strengthening public policies and administrative, legislative, judicial, and budgetary measures to ensure that persons of African descent in the Americas can enjoy their economic, social, cultural, civil, and political rights and fully participate on equal terms in all areas of society. My office, in close collaboration with member states, has also undertaken activities to promote the legacy and contributions of persons of African descent in the Americas, most notably through its yearly commemorative events to celebrate Black History Month in February. Furthermore, in March of this year, we organized for the first time a permanent council to commemorate the International Day of Remembrance for the victims of slavery and the transatlantic slave trade, and most recently included an agenda item in the permanent council to celebrate diversity in the Americas, which focused on both Afro-descendant and indigenous communities. In addition, 
the OAS Art Museum of the Americas, which is the first museum in the United States of modern and contemporary art from Latin America and the Caribbean, holds a permanent collection featuring artists such as Wilfredo Lam from Cuba, Everald Brown from Jamaica, Joseph Jean Gill from Haiti. Currently, the Art Museum is working with the OS Department of Social Inclusion, Harvard University, and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture to curate a special exhibition of its permanent collection to highlight the African influence on art of the Americas. Today, we are particularly honored to host this event along with the United Nations as we take into consideration the first goal behind the celebration of the International Decade for People of African Descent, which is recognition. Today's documentary and subsequent panel discussion will help us to acknowledge the past and work together towards the future. I wish to thank Dr. Sheila Walker, the panelists, our co-partners for this event, the United Nations Department of Public Information and Afro Diaspora Inc. for their collaboration and you, the audience, for coming today to share in this most enlightening discussion. I also wish to thank all the people in my office who have worked so tirelessly to put it together in collaboration with the other secretariats of the OAS. I am sure that this decade marks only the genesis of a wider and stronger commitment towards affirming the rights of millions of persons of African descent in the Americas, millions of people working tirelessly towards recognition, justice, and development that they all deserve. Thank you very much. Thank you, Assistant Secretary General, for that uh, incisive overview of OAS and um, the OAS's involvement in the subject matter. So there you have the evidence for those who want to know what the OAS has been doing on this subject. Thank you again, ASG. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sheila Walker, but before I invite her to the stage, We'd like to offer a brief overview of Dr. Walker's work. As Executive Director of Afro Diaspora Inc., Dr. Walker has done field work. She has lectured, consulted, and participated in cultural events in most of Africa and the global African diaspora. She also has numerous scholarly and popular publications out. Her most recent works are the documentary Slave Roots, or Routes, a global vision produced by UNESCO's Slave Route Project, and an edited book Conocimiento desde adentro, los afro-sudamericanos hablan de sus pueblos y de sus historias. In English, that would be Afro-South Americans speak of their people and their stories, featuring articles by Afro-descendants from all of the Spanish-speaking countries of South America. She also edited the volume African Roots, African American Cultures, Africa in the Creation of the Americas, and produced the documentary Scattered Africa, Faces and Voices of the African Diaspora, based on the international conference that she had organized with support from UNESCO on, quote, the African Diaspora and the Modern World. Dr. Walker was Executive Director of the Center for African and Ameri African American Studies and Professor of Anthropology at the University of Texas at Austin, and then Director of the African Diaspora and the World Program and Professor of Anthropology at Spelman College. Without further ado, Dr. Walker, you have the podium. No primeiro idioma da diáspora africana, boa tarde a todas e a todos. Estou muito contente de estar aqui na nossa casa da família pan-americana. In the second language of the African diaspora in the Americas, I am very pleased to be here in the house of our Pan-American family. Buenas tardes a todos y a todas. Estoy muy feliz de estar aquí en la casa de nuestra familia de las Américas. 
bonsoir <rire> à toute notre famille de la, des, des Amériques. Je suis heureuse d'être dans la maison de notre grande famille panaméricaine. <rire> I can't indulge in anglophone hegemony without showing a bit more consciousness. <laughs> so I'm thrilled to be here. I'm an only child, or I was an only child. And as you will notice by my images, I have decided to make the world my family. And I am thrilled to have this opportunity to share these images with you today. I hope that, uh, well, I hope that you'll be somewhat surprised to see some of the familiar faces in places where you may not expect to find them. I was, but now I'm not surprised anymore. And I hope you'll be inspired to want to know more about this larger story of the global African diaspora and about not only its unfortunate circumstances, but about its triumphs over the unfortunate circumstances that made this African diaspora global. And without stealing my own thunder by telling you what I'm going to show you, <laughs> I think that I will stop talking and so you can see the images. Thank you. people who laid the foundations of the modern Americas were of African origin. Of the 6.5 million people who crossed the Atlantic during the first 300 of the 500-year history of the modern Americas, only 1 million came from Europe. 5.5 million people were brought from Africa during the inhuman commerce in human lives known as the transatlantic slave trade. Africans enslaved in the Americas were forced to do the work of building the European colonies that became the American republics. Some Africans were selected specifically for their technological expertise. Africans had been working with iron for thousands of years, and their descendants continued to make both useful objects and beautiful works of art. You look around the wall here, this is some of my work, and that's them two years. So now I ran in the blacksmith shop to shoe off. You know, I didn't dream I would be making gifts, things like these, things like this. African knowledge helped feed the Americas with rice domesticated more than 3,000 years ago in West Africa. U.S. plantation owners asked slave ship captains to bring them skilled rice negroes. The Portuguese enslaved Africans from what was called the Gold Coast to mine gold in Brazil. 
They said these Africans, whom they called mining Negroes, had an almost magical luck in finding gold. Luck or expertise? Toda a tecnologia empregada aqui na extração do ouro, ela é devido a esse conhecimento africano. Eles precisaram dessa mão de obra especializada. Então eles vão numa região específica da África, que é a região que a gente chama de Costa da Mina, né? E já tinha grandes reinos no passado que faziam uso desse ouro, né? Aí a gente fala do, do reino Ashanti, né? Do grande reino do Mali também. Não fosse a presença africana, não fosse o saber e o conhecimento trazido pelos africanos, que embora não tenham chegado aqui como mão de obra escravizada, Portugal jamais teria conseguido tirar daqui o volume de ouro que tirou. In Ecuador, descendants of mining Negroes still pan gold and transform it into beautiful creations like those of their African ancestors. By the end of the 19th century, 12 to 15 million Africans had been scattered throughout the Americas. More than 200 million African descendants now live throughout the Americas, some in unexpected places. Los afros ya estamos, estamos visibilizándonos, ¿no? porque obviamente habíamos vivido siempre desde cuando la colonia, pero estábamos como ocultos, no, no, no estábamos eh, mostrando nuestra identidad. Pero ahora estamos muy visibilizados ya, en cambio estamos reconocidos por la nueva Comisión Política del Estado, entonces estamos incluidos en, en lo que es eh, Bolivia. Across Africa, people play the game of sophisticated mathematical strategy that in some places is called wari. The game is one of the many elements of their cultures that Africans brought with them to the Americas. Wari is still played in the Caribbean, most prominently on the island of Antigua. I asked the Prime Minister to tell me one thing. Africans in Antigua have something tangible that they have now that they brought from Africa. And a woman shout out in the crowd, Wari. <laughs> Jawara, who was a math teacher in Antigua, brought his knowledge and skills to the United States. He makes wari boards and plays and teaches the game on the street in Harlem. The Antiguans believe that wari is their game. And some, some Antiguans believe that there's no other people on earth that plays wari. <laughs> okay. So the object of the game is to capture 25 seeds on the opponent's side of the, of, the, of the board. You have six houses, these are called houses. Six times four is 24 house seeds on your side. To make a play, you will take all the seeds up from any one of your houses. So take up, make a choice, and you place one seed in the next and one. Yes, I used to play when I was a child. Yes, absolutely. But it's all over when you go to Africa. It's everybody in the street play. It's very common. Okay, now to play. You want to play? Yes, of course. So counting the, uh, yes. That's why everybody in Africa play this because yeah. it's very smart. 
Um, Antigua is the only place where the players are buried with the sport. When they died, they made sure that they took one of these um, worry boards to heaven. <laughs> Almost half of the Africans who arrived in the Americas came from the Central African region of the Kingdom of Congo. And some African diaspora communities perpetuate Congo royal pageantry. For centuries, the Congo Kingdom was respected in the Atlantic world as an African Christian kingdom. Such esteem was reflected in European artists' portrayals of Congo diplomats. This bust of a Congo diplomat who traveled to the Vatican in the 1600s for an audience with the Pope is in the Basilica of Santa Maria Maggiore in Rome. In the Americas, in spite of slavery, African descendants perpetuated memories of royal traditions from the Kingdom of Congo. This reenactment of a 19th century Congo ceremony with a contra dance from European royal courts. And quickly segues into much more African rhythms and movements. Brazilians in the state of Minas Gerais portray the pageantry of the royal courts of the kings and queens of Congo. Delegations come from afar, seeking blessings from Afro-Brazilian Congo kings and queens. Congo ceremonies are less formal and more playful, with Congo royals dancing exuberantly to drumming of African origin. Some people characterize Panama's Congo celebrations as a parody of the Spanish monarchy. A more plausible interpretation is that, as elsewhere in the Americas, they represent a continuity of the Congo monarchy. The African diaspora does not just exist in the Atlantic world of the Americas, it is global. On South Pacific islands that Europeans called Melanesia for the melanin-rich skin of their inhabitants, people whose ancestors settled there thousands of years ago identify with global African diasporan culture. Africans were enslaved on Indian Ocean Islands to work on plantations, as in the Americas.
avec l'esclavage, nous avons, le peuple noir a été éparpillé, éparpillé à travers le monde, que ce soit aux Caraïbes, en Amérique euh, ou ailleurs, à Maurice, dans les îles de l'océan Indien. Africans were also enslaved across the Mediterranean Sea to Turkey during the Ottoman Empire. Bu insanları bir araya toplamanın, bu insanlarla bir arada konuşmanın, bu insanlarla birçok sorunu paylaşmanın yolunun dernek olduğunu bildiğim için dernek girişimi olarak yola çıktım ve 2006 sonlarında Afrikalılar Kültür Dayanışma ve Yardımlaşma adı altında derneğimizi kurduk. Arkadaşlar, 7. Dana Bayramı başlamıştır. Tüm halkımıza Dana Bayramı bir yıl boyunca sağlık, mutluluk ve bol verim vermesini dilerim. Herkesin Dana Bayramı'nı kutlarım. Because she said, we are coming all together, we are seeing each other, talking and sharing something. So she she's happy about that. <laughs> all the black people are celebrating, and she's saying to anyone. Renklerimiz bir ya. Renklerimiz bir. Because. India offers a variety of African diasporan experiences that contrast with and complement those of the Americas. Um, some people are come from Sudan, some people are come from Ethiopia. Africa, my father told me that they came from Sudan. Now my father's, father's, grandfather's, they're all from Africa. Now they live here, here we are becoming like Indians now. Oh, so many species are India, in India. We are uh, African Indians. Tens of thousands of Afro-Indians, known as Siddhis, whose ancestors came from East Africa, form distinct communities in several states. Until India's independence, Siddhis were palace guards for the Nizams, the rulers of the princely state of Hyderabad. I'm from Nizigat in Hyderabad. During Nizam period, he brought some people from Africa for his army. In Gujarat, the Siddhi Said Mosque, known for its lacy carved stone windows, bears the name of its 16th century creator, who came from Northeast Africa. Mm -hmm. 
on Maharashtra's Konkani coast, Siddhis were famous for centuries for controlling maritime traffic from their fort on Janjira Island, which is now a national landmark. In Karnataka, Siddhis whose ancestors came from Southeast Africa live in rural areas. The Africans, they were brought here and they were stay. They just spread out in the forest. They celebrated the election of President Barack Obama, whom they consider one of their own people, proudly claiming him as an American Siddi. Wherever they were enslaved, Africans and their descendants resisted bondage. Centuries ago, some of them, referred to as Maroons, escaped to inaccessible places and created autonomous communities. Haiti's citadel is the world's greatest monument to the triumph of an enslaved population. Haitians defeated Napoleon's army, the most powerful army in Europe, to free themselves and create the world's first independent black republic and the first government to outlaw slavery. On Mauritius and Reunion Island in the Indian Ocean, people enslaved by the British and French escaped to remote highlands to form free communities in rugged environments. I think the real site of Maronnage in the Reunion is the site of Perfect. Aujourd'hui, nous dans le site culturel, le paysage culturel du monde, c'est qu'à l'époque, durant l'époque de l'esclavage, durant la période française et britannique, il y a à différents moments un groupe d'esclaves qui s'est sauvé des picots de Banmet pour venir trouver refuge dans la montagne là. Et dans un document historique, avec une interview qui nous fait avec Ben Dimoun qui fait dire nous qui c'est ce qu'on appelle la République des Marrons qui s'est installé dans la montagne là. Alors ça, tout ça est bien important parce que c'est le combat des marrons pour la, affirmer le statut d'être libre et d'être humain. C'est un combat qui est euh, le premier phénomène dans l'île Maurice. Nous considérons ben, nous ben, dans cette marron comme ben, un précurseur, ben, un pionnier dans la lutte pour la liberté. People in Colombia's Palenque de San Basilio celebrate their maroon heritage. The founder of the Palenque, not only the Palenque San Basilio, but the man who, between 37 and 37 women and women, who were disembarked there in the city of Cartagena, went to the mountains and founded the Palenque San Basilio. The marimbula is a version of the Central African instrument called mbira, sansa, and other names. Jamaica honors its freedom-seeking heritage by featuring its national heroine, Maroon leader Queen Nanny, on the bill that people call a nanny. The United States is scheduled to follow Jamaica's lead with Harriet Tubman, who freed hundreds of people from bondage proposed to be the first woman on a U.S. bill that some are already calling a Tubman. 
Spirituality is the realm in which African diasporan communities have best maintained ancestral worldviews and behaviors. In Salvador, capital of Brazil state of Bahia, African divinities, the Orishas of the Yoruba people of Nigeria and Benin in West Africa, characterize the city's cultural and spiritual life. In spiritual ceremonies and secular performances such as this one, the Orishas dance cosmic choreographies, portraying their roles in nature and human life. Across the Indian Ocean, Afro-descendant communities also venerate spiritual beings of African origin. Baba Gore, the African saint of the Siddhis from Gujarat, comes from Abyssinia, or Ethiopia, in Northeast Africa. Baba Gore arrived in the village of Ratampur as an agate merchant 800 years ago. It's come from uh, <coughs> Baba Gore. Baba Gore also had great spiritual powers, and Siddhis built a shrine in his honor. As guardians of the shrine, they share Baba Gore's blessings with fellow Siddhis and with other Indians. <laughs> Baba Gore is now worshipped not only by Siddhis, but also by other Indians of various faiths. Because Iberian Catholics dominated the enslaving of Africans in the Americas, several Afro-descendant communities worship black Catholic saints. Patron saint of Palermo in Sicily, St. Benedict's parents, enslaved in Italy, were from Ethiopia. Como somos de la diáspora africana, entonces queremos conocer también las festividades que cada pueblo o región o territorio del, de esta Suramérica, festejan a sus santos negros. Adopting these saints, Africans and their descendants also adapted them to an African understanding of how to celebrate them joyously. Balthazar, also from Northeast Africa, was the African of the three kings who the Bible said took gifts for the birth of Jesus. Y es un santo negro, como dice ella, como nosotros, que, eh, que, que nos identifica en realidad porque eh, es un santo que nosotros consideramos que es un santo de los afrodescendientes. No puede ser de otro color, sino como nosotros. In the community chapel, Balthazar carries an incense burner representing his gift of precious incense. Another segment of the Afro-Paraguayan community called Kambakwa, their name coming from the Ba Kamba people of the Republic of Congo, celebrates a different version of the saint. This Balthazar carries not an incense burner, but a drum, called by the Central African Bantu term kandombe, that also designates the community's music and dance. 
le gusta todo lo que es el tambor, el baile, todo eso le gusta. Night before Three Kings Day, January 6th, the Kambakwa begin to celebrate their African saint. Kambakwa also organized an annual festival attended by thousands of people at which they honor their African saint. Saint Martin de Porres, the only black saint born in the Americas, is famous in his native Peru for his miraculous healing. In river communities in Esmeraldas province, in Peru's neighboring Ecuador, St. Martin also saves people from drowning. The communities organize a river procession to Canchimalero, partying their way to St. Martin's party. The usual quiet village of Canchimalero explodes when thousands of people converge to celebrate their saint. se comprometen, ¿no? Por algo bueno que les haya hecho, por un milagro. Yo había viajado en muchos países en África, bastante. Pero la vida, celebrar con alegría, eso es típicamente africano. Esta manera de vivir con la fiesta, con la alegría, eso es puramente africano, la danza. African descendants scattered around the world used vital ancestral memories and knowledge to help develop new societies as they incubated new identities and created exuberant cultural forms, insisting on celebrating life as they continue to enrich global civilization. Very well done, Dr. Walker. Actually, I was trying to summon some thoughts and only one word came to me, wow. So thank you for this awesome presentation. Um, some of us know bits and pieces, but it's so wonderful to see it all brought together. Thank you again. It's. It's really a fitting entree to the next portion, the uh, panel discussion, which is why you'd see some chairs up here. And it's my distinct pleasure to begin 
to introduce those who will be leading the panel discussion. So we'll be bringing to the stage Dr. Sheila Walker, Dr. Anna Curtis, who is the Museum Curator, Latinx Studies, National Museum of African American History and Culture. Welcome. Dr. Betilde Munoz Pogosian, Director of the Social, Department of Social Inclusion in the OAS Secretariat for Rights and Equity, for Access to Rights and Equity, pardon me. And our next panelist, Omaima David, focal point for the United Nations Remember Slavery Program. And she hails from Antigua, and Barbuda, I should add. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator for this session, Mr. Mauricio Ranz, who is the OAS Secretary for Access to Rights and Equity. <laughs> Mr. Ranz received his Juris Doctor's degree from the Federal University of Pernambuco and concluded a specialization in labor affairs and industrial relations at the University of Bari in Italy. He received a Master of Science and PhD from Oxford University in England. He's author of the books Labor Relations and the New Unionism in Contemporary Brazil. And by the way, that's where he hails from. And without getting into the details of his resume, which is quite um, significant here, I want to welcome Mr. Rands. And of course, you will be uh, running the show here. So, Mr. Rands. You have the steering. Oh, they're trying to set up the microphones. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now it is. All now right. Is. Thank you. Good afternoon to everybody. Dear friends, Dr. Walker, Bethilde, our dear guests. It's really a very important session for us here in the OES, my dear Ambassador, Mr. Mendes. I come, uh, I come from a country with the, the largest uh, Afro-descendant population in the world outside Africa. We are the second largest population, if we include Africa, second only to Nigeria. And in Brazil, I come from the state of Pernambuco, where we had a strong tradition of resistance, of resilience of the Afro-descendant people who came to the plantations organized by the Portuguese colonizer in the, in the country, but starting in the state of Pernambuco. So right at the beginning, the Afro-descendants in my home state of Pernambuco started organizing resistance and popular struggle. We have a very famous and important event in our history, which is the Quilombo de Zumbi dos Palmares. For almost one century, in the 18th century, they fled the plantations, the sugarcane plantations, and they settled themselves in Quilombo, in a, an area that was at the time part of the state of Pernambuco. So Zumbi of Palmares for us is a symbol of popular struggle. Then I grew up in the middle of a culture which was all the time permeated by the contribution of people of African descent. In the carnival, the famous Brazilian carnival, I would say that there wouldn't be carnival in Brazil if it was not the contribution of the Afro-descendants in the country. So we have very good rhythms, like frevo, samba, bumba meu boi, maracatu. So all the rhythms that we have, we owe to the contribution of the people of African descent. We have contribution in the literature. For example, the father of Brazilian literature, the creator of Brazilian Academy of Letters, Machado de Assis, is a, a man 
of Afro descendants very uh, clear. So uh, we have contributions in the culinary, in the arts, in the literature, in the music, in the religion, but still we are a very, very problematic country on the issue. That's the reason why Brazil was the first country in the world to create a specific ministry to promote racial equality. It's a peer. So it was followed, Hernando was telling me, by Honduras. So uh, the country has this debt with the Afro-descended people, but the, the country, or at least part of public opinion and officials and civil society in the country, is well aware of this historical debt. And we have to do with OAS, with the international community, with international civil society, with all the member states of the OAS, we are very committed to do something. And here, I'm very glad that I'm joining the Secretariat for Access to Rights, for Equity, and I have met a very committed team who is here, Bethilde and others that I see here, and I join an organization like OAS that has this commitment. So that's the that thing that makes me really very, very, very happy. And to see that we have the commitment of more rights to more people, immediately we can develop this slogan, this mission, saying that we have to promote more rights to more Afro-descent people. So uh, I feel very, very, very comfortable with the initiative of Ambassador Nestor Mendes, the, our Assistant General, with all the support of the OES, of the General Secretary, to have a session like this, to have the gift of see this picture, congratulations, is really very, very, very beautiful, very well conceived. And I know that we could develop films like those in all the areas, in the areas of science, of culture, of literature, of music, of song, of popular resistance. So it's an endless agenda that a session and a debate like this helps to promote. And we are very happy to be uh, with people from the museum, from the United Nations. So OS is really in a great session this afternoon. I'd like to address some initial questions to the panelists, and then we develop uh, being aware that the, the, the session is organized to allow everybody here to raise questions after the panelists, all right? So to start with, I will provoke you, the panelists, with three broad questions. First, what is each, institu what is each institution doing to help educate and highlight the contributions of people of African descent. So the particular contribution of uh, each institution that is here in the panel. A second general question. What, what is, why is it important to highlight the contributions of people of African descent nowadays? And what's the relevance of the film to the, film, to the work being done by each institution? And to you, my dear Sheila, I would like to address the following quest. The films show very clear the resilience, strength, and adaptability of people of African descent. In countries such as Turkey and India, I visited India and I was not aware of this presence. I visited New Delhi, Bombay, and Goa, and I, I couldn't understand this presence. It was very, a very important contribution of your film. However, how would you describe their inclusion, the process of inclusion of those people in those unexpected countries? What steps are they doing to improve their lot in society achievements? So that's the initial questions to provoke our panelists in the good sense. Okay, so I will give uh, the word first to my left, Batilda, and then we follow the panels, all right? Please, Batilda. Thank you very much. 
Mauricio, and hello to everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here. So to prepare some of my remarks, I did my numbers. So if the 200 million people of African descent in the Americas were a country, they would be 53 times the size of Panama, 19 times the size of the Dominican Republic, 10 times the size of Chile, just to run some numbers. So how can we still, some, of, some, some people deny that they, have an in, they are an integral part of what we are as a, as a region. So, and I think I also want to join uh, Mauricio and Ambassador Mendez in congratulating Dr. Walker on uh, preparing this fi film, which clearly shows the resilience and, and the different contributions that the African diaspora uh, can make. And uh, I especially want to admit that I was not aware of the uh, diaspora uh, that was present in India, or actually Turkey, and even Bolivia, which is one of our member states. And, I did know that there was some influence, but I didn't know that it was, and it was so eclectic combined with the indigenous population. So what are we doing at the OAS uh, to move the agenda of human rights and social inclusion of Afro-descendants uh, forward, 200 million citizens of the Americas? Uh, and I wanna just highlight very briefly to, to start the conversation, three areas of work here at the OAS. The first one uh, has already been mentioned by Ambassador Mendes in our region, we have a legal, in a legal instrument, the Inter-American Convention Against Racism, Racial Discrimination and Related Forms of Intolerance, and we also have a, sh a, a, sh a mirror uh, convention uh, on against all forms of intolerance that specifically address the protection of the rights of Afro-descendants among a series of other groups in vulnerable situations. Building on the tenets of the 1965 United Nations International Convention on the Elimination of, of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, this Inter-American instrument reaffirms two key uh, democratic principles, equality before the law and the right to non-discrimination. And why are these conventions important? Uh, from our standpoint, of course, it provides a framework of guarantees for the human rights of Afro-descendants, among other groups, of course, and second, because it also makes an important contribution to international law by proposing legally binding definitions of racism, multiple or aggravated discrimination and intolerance. As was mentioned by Ambassador Mendes until today, we have 12 member states who have uh, signed the convention and two, Costa Rica and Uruguay, who have actually uh, ratified the convention. And we recently had a, a ceremony last Thursday actually with the permanent mission of Uruguay, uh, which deposited the ratified treaty here at the OAS. And starting last Thursday, uh, 30 days counting from last Thursday, which I understand will be November the 11th, this convention will enter into force for these countries. So of course we make an invitation to all member states to follow the lead of these two countries and ratify this convention. The second point that I wanted to make is of course that for the 2015, 2014, 20, 24 period, the United Nations approved the International Decade of People of African Descent, uh, an agenda that focuses on three key principles, recognition, justice, and development for Afro-descendants in the world. And it's important to mention that here at the OAS, the member states um, took on the challenge on agreeing on a, or on a regional plan of action to implement this uh, decade. And the plan was approved in 2016, at the OAS General Assembly celebrated in the Dominican Republic and calls for action on two different levels. On one level at the organizational level within our secretariat, whereby the OAS is mandated to include the rights of persons of African descent on the agenda of meetings of ministers and high authorities as well as in different policies, programs, and projects that we implement from the General Secretariat. And on a second level, it establishes a sort of soft commitment between states to implement at the country level specific actions to improve the status of people of African descent. The vision is that by 2024, member states will have strengthened policies, programs, and projects to recognize, promote, protect, and observe the rights of uh, people of African descent. And, uh, and I think it's also important to mention that some countries following this lead have actually uh, even taking this regional plan and this universal commitment and regional plan uh, approved at the OAS at the national level, and now we have countries like Costa Rica, Uruguay, 
Peru, Colombia, amongst others, who have actually developed specific national plans uh, uh, to ensure the implementation of the decade. And the third and, and final point before uh, uh, we continue the conversation I wanted to make is uh, the, the type of work that we are carrying out here at the General Secretariat of the OAS to support this agenda. Uh, we are lucky in that both the Secretary General and the Assistant Secretary General have, are personally committed to guaranteeing more rights for all, including, of course, people of African descent. And as a result, they are very invested in um, adopting an institutional-wide approach uh, to promoting and protecting the rights of Afro-descendants. And uh, also, I want to bring to your attention a recent revamping of the work uh, that we do here at the General Secretariat. We had a recent restructuring of the OAS to address these challenges in a very deliberate way. And of course, important to recognize the work that was being done uh, previously via the Department of International Law in uh, implementing actions to, um, to make the Afro-descendant variable a cross-cutting issue in the work of the OAS. But in 2015, with the creation of the Secretariat for Access to Rights and Equity and the Department of Social Inclusion, a new, we call it like a new area, era of work has started in which the issue of combating racial discrimination in all its manifestations at the individual, structural, and institutional level has actually become the driving force of our work. Um, earlier uh, this year, the Secretary General also uh, sent an instruction to all, sec all secretariats and all the staff to actually start incorporating the, ver the Afro-descendant variable more explicitly in all our projects and programs, and I think it's very important uh, to mention. Um, to conclude, uh, while we should admit, of course, that ra racism, discrimination, intolerance, and, and uh, all these hurdles continue to be part of the lives of millions of people in our region, uh, we should also recognize, just as uh, Dr. Walker has done through this film, that Afro-descendants have provided our region with important legacies, knowledge, technology, history, and traditions that we must recognize and capitalize on because they are indeed part of our identity as a region. Um, 200 million people, 53 Panamas, 10 Chiles should not be hard to miss, and we must celebrate it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Regarding the convention, we have just uh, decided yesterday, we decided to create with the Inter-American Inter -American Commission on Human Rights, uh, with the SADI, we are creating a working group in order to monitor, to promote the ratification and enforcement of the Convention on Racism. So we'll be following very closely the implementation of this convention, as Bertilde has said, is on the, uh, on the 11th, uh, 11th November, it will be enforced. So we are, we are trying very closely to promote ratification by other member states, and the most important, its implementation in every state, member state of the OES. So I have the pleasure uh, to give the floor to Ariana Kurtz. She comes from the National Museum of African American History and Culture. You have the floor. Thank you very much. <laughs> like my colleague, I also had to write down my thoughts to make sure that I would stay on task here, because um, I too was really moved by the film, I'm excited that it exists. I'm hoping that we can use it as a tool at the museum, and I know we'll definitely continue to talk about what that can look like. Um, but what does the National Museum of African American History and Culture, what are we doing to help educate and highlight contributions of people of African descent? Well, after a very long time coming, we exist. We celebrated our first year anniversary <laughs> just last month in, in a prominent place here on the National Mall. We're the only national museum in the United States devoted exclusively to the documentation of African-American life, history, and culture. I think visitors are pleasantly surprised by the ways in which the museum rightly connects the African-American experience to the rest of the African diaspora and to the world. The museum understands African-Americanness as a globally created identity that is not bound by US borders and that shares African heritage and therefore cultural continuities and cultural expressions with other African descendant people around the world. We educate and highlight 
the contributions of African descended people in US art, history, and culture, but we don't divorce these contributions from the transatlantic slave trade, from voluntary black migrations to and from the United States, or black connectedness throughout the hemisphere and the globe. And if you haven't been to the museum, you do see that. You see the African diaspora represented. You see other multiple black ethnicities and identities represented in every gallery throughout the museum. <clears throat> so I wanted to not just say what we're doing, but how we're doing it, how we are educated and how we are highlighting. Um, through the architecture of the building itself, which I will talk about in a minute, um, our exhibitions, of course, our diverse public programming, our website has a lot of wonderful information, not just hours and location, but you can actually read essays by curators and see images of objects if you haven't been able to visit the space. Um, our outreach, participation in different community events, but also our digital outlets. So we've had almost three million visitors actually pass physically through the museum, but we have over three times that amount that follow us on social media. So through Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or Tumblr, and particularly with Twitter because they're shorter, a lot of different outlets and embassies will translate that information and send it out. And so that's one way that we're able to reach well beyond the museum walls and in different languages. So this is my favorite question. What is the relevance of the film to the work done at the National Museum of African American History and Culture? I think it's a beautiful representation of the cultural continuity, as Dr. Walter put it in the film, and I love that it's called Familiar Faces, Unexpected Places. I think even in that title, we all knew that we were gonna learn something new. So we at the museum enter this conversation about the African diaspora and its communities, also from unexpected places. Um, it's especially brilliant to have a film that connects so beautifully with the very first object in our museum's collection, which was a wooden boat seat donated by Afro-Ecuadorian scholar Juan Garcia Salazar, who's from El Morabas, Ecuador. <coughs> one of the places in the film. So for anyone who's visited the museum, it's on the top floor in the Cultural Expressions Gallery. And so thinking about all the ways that culture has learned behavior is preserved and passed down and used to educate, with the boat seat you have an actual tangible object, material culture that's at the museum. You have the intangible culture of language and storytelling that it represents, and now with this documentary we have this sense of cultural preservation and how that has permeated throughout the African diaspora. And the one other thing that I wanted to connect directly between the National Museum of African American History and Culture and the film is the ironwork of Charleston, South Carolina, as shown in the film. So our building, the corona, as it's called, corona's crown in Spanish, the three tiers is inspired by crowns used in Yoruban art from West Africa. And the panels reflect the design of ironwork by African American craftsmen, both enslaved and free, past and present, in South Carolina and Louisiana especially. So even being able to tie that artistry as shown in the film to the physical edifice of the building is really powerful. And then to be able to share that story around the African diaspora and issues of African heritage. And the last question, why is it important to highlight the contributions of people of African descent? Basically, there are too many versions of history that try to omit us, our contributions, our accomplishments, and there are many spaces globally where we're under-recognized, omitted, or disconnected from each other. And so it's so important to see black people, which is what this documentary shows us, right? So we should be talking about history and cultural continuities and material culture and intangible cultural preservation, but it's so important to just see black people in all of these global spaces as modern living beings, because our visibility is critical to then access rights and representation. So I think that is the largest takeaway, you know, being able to, that you were able to travel around these places and document that we exist in all of these different spaces. So thank you for that. Now it is. Thanks. Now I have the pleasure to give the word, the floor to our friend Omima Dave. She is from the United Nations, Nation Remember Slavery Program. Thank you very much. You have the floor. On my own? Yeah. Thank you very much. And again, I just want to thank the Assistant Secretary General, I know you had to step away, and the team at OES for being such wonderful hosts and for readily agreeing to host this collaborative event and even for the museum to participate. As you heard, I am with the United Nations Department of Public Information, Remember Slavery Program. That program is not the same as the decade, which is housed at the um, Office for the Human Rights 
in Geneva. But um, we work in close collaboration and we support the initiatives of the, the decade. The exhibit which is on display outside is a collaboration between our program and the decade. So we do work together to help to accomplish the themes and the objectives of the decade. And um, our mandate came directly from the General Assembly in 2007 to focus on education, to focus on educating about the causes, consequences, and lessons of slavery and the transatlantic slave trade, as well as to raise awareness of the dangers of racism and prejudice today. I joined the team in 2015, and I am honored to be the focal point for that program. And our program of activities each year is surrounding a theme which is determined or decided upon in collaboration with the African member states, the CARICOM member states, as well as UNESCO, the representatives, sorry, from UNESCO. And the theme that we chose for 2017 is Remember Slavery, Recognizing the Legacy and Contributions of People of African Descent. So actually, this theme that we are focusing on today is the theme that has been guiding our activities for this year. In February of this year, we hosted a film screening in partnership with the African Burial Ground in New York. Um, that film is Maya Angelou and Still I Rise. We actually screened it. We had two screenings before it was aired on PBS. And we had in-house with us the co-director, Rita coburn Wack, who knew Dr. Angelo very intimately. She actually managed her diary for a while, and she also worked um, at Oprah Radio. So she had very close and intimate contact with Dr. Angelo, and so was able to engage us in some more intimate discussions of this renowned writer, artist, and activist, and who is not just an African American um, person whose work is celebrating for our contributions, but Dr. Angelo's work is celebrated around the world. Then um, in March of every year, we commemorate or recognize um, the victims, or we honor the victims of slavery and the transatlantic slave trade. But, um, on the 25th of March, we call that day International Day for the Remembrance of the Victims of Slavery and the transatlantic slave trade. And on that day, well, this day it fell on a Saturday, so we had the recognition on the Friday. There was a solemn gathering of the member states at the General Assembly, and um, we invited Dr. Lonnie Bunch from the museum to be the keynote speaker, and that was followed by solemn statements by the various member states. And then we proceeded to do what we do best, which is to have a cultural and culinary event to celebrate the culinary and cultural resilience. And member states have had a chance to present national dishes or present dishes and beverages um, for well over 300 to 500 persons who were invited to be a part of this. And we had a live jazz band to also demonstrate the resilience of our music as it um, transcends the slave trade. Then um, we also partnered with the International Slavery Museum in Liverpool, London, to host an exhibit titled A Legacy of Black Achievers. That museum has a Black Achievers wall gallery where it features well over 100 notable personalities who are making significant contributions around the world. And this year's was that museum's 10th anniversary and the 10th anniversary for our program as well. <coughs> and so we had a joint 10th anniversary exhibit which features 21 notable personalities of various backgrounds around the world. And that exhibit is presently, um, it was displayed at the United Nations um, in the UN visitors lobby for about three weeks, but it's presently traveling and it's, at the, um, it's been on display at the Medgar Evers College in Brooklyn. 
and we are open to loaning it to other colleges and universities across the United States. And I should also say that we are preparing a traveling version, which we're going to make available for download on our website and making that available as well to travel to our UN information centers around the world. And um, in May of this year, we hosted, uh, <coughs> I'm sorry, my thought is, an NGO briefing, which is um, to, as part of our outreach to civil society, we brought in renowned panelists, such as um, Dr. Joseph Inikuri, he's an economic historian in, at the University of Rochester. Um, Dean Benson, Dean Ben Vinson at George Washington University, Professor Vivian Shepherd from the University of the West Indies, and Cy Richardson from the National Urban League. And that discussion focused exclusively on the social and economic contributions that people of African descent have made to the development of societies around the world. And then we later hosted a global student video conference with over 500 students assembled at the United Nations. And they were linked via video conferencing with students in Jamaica and Liberia. And all the students were given as an assignment to study a black achiever in another region because we recognize that our history tends to focus specifically on our region. I'm from Antigua. I was only taught West Indian history. Recently engaged a Brazilian who told me he wasn't even taught Latin American history, but only Brazilian history. And so is the case here in the United States. And so in order to broaden that conversation about that global African diaspora and for our youth to learn about black achievers, not only in their small world, we gave them that assignment and they had a chance to share that information with each other in small groups and some even had a chance to present to the wider body, as well as um, get creative with the presentation, whether through cultural expressions of whoever that personality that they were studying. And the children were asked to prepare an evaluation after of what that day was like. And just reading the reports, it was all positive and very rewarding. Um, those are just a few of the activities that you know, I wanted to highlight that we have engaged in for the year. And in terms of, um, to answer the question as for the relevance of this film to the work that we do and to highlighting the contribution of people of African descent. Well, Dr. Walker and I met at an Ocela conference um, in 2015. And I went into one of the, um, the breakout sessions, which is about, oh, it was several, about 2,000 sessions that they had? Yes. But anyway, a stellar conference has a lot, a lot of sessions. But then I saw that there was a UN person listed to be on this panel, and I was there to be on a panel as well. So I was wondering why UN had two panelists. And so I said, let me go and support my colleague. And then I went in, I realized Dr. Walker was mistakenly listed in the program, but it was a good mistake because it caused our paths to cross. And um, I tried to slip my card into her hand after seeing a few of the clips of the images that she was presenting from the, her various trips as an anthropologist. And I was particularly moved by one of the images when I saw in Colombia that they were preparing something in banana leaves that looked something very similar to one of our national dishes. And so I said I would like to engage her some more because it, just by seeing that image, it helped to broaden my worldview. It helped me to see, um, see us on a much wider scale and you know, so that, that people of African descent, the minority syndrome we tend to suffer from. You know, I seen more of us helped me to feel, okay, there are more of us out there and we're doing similar things. And just being able to, to identify, I also found that to be rather empowering. And so she held my hand and said, don't go too far. And she stayed close to me. And then that turned out to be an hour conversation. I said, you know what? We need a film. 
we need to have a content that we can utilize in the classrooms or we can utilize in small groups to help with that identity piece. Because yes, the decade of people of African descent has been declared by the United Nations, but we have to make the things work for us. And the recognition piece is very important. I know that you know, there's a lot of argument for reparation, the justice portion, and I totally support those arguments and the development piece because our people have been disadvantaged wherever we are around the world. And the issues of inequality continue to raise its head. But I think that recognition is also or equally important to all those pegs in order for us to first know who we are, own that space of who we are, celebrate who we are in order to earn the respect from others in society. And so I congratulate Dr. Walker on her product and certainly look forward to working with her. As I already said to her, we need to develop a study guide to go with this so that we can help to create more content and stimulate the discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Lomima. Now let's listen to Dr. Walker. She has the floor. You have the floor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll limit myself to the second language of the African diaspora, just English. Um, well, I'm thrilled to have had the opportunity to share this effort with you. And um, I was, Nicolas Guillén, Afro-Cuban poet, uh, has a poem in which the refrain is, sin conocernos nos reconoceremos, without knowing each other, we will recognize each other. And his poem goes on to talk about a variety of sufferings, negativities. Well, I don't do victimization. I don't do negativity. Um, and so I am so aware that without knowing all these folks, when I went to visit them, I recognized similarities. And they recognize similarities with me too. The Afro-Indian woman who is holding up the Obama cake, when um, I was visiting them, they were looking at me and saying, hmm, she looks like one of our people. <laughs> so maybe she's like Obama. She's one of our people from the Americas. So I'm struck by the commonalities. And the, um, for example, one night I was looking at some of my images just to see if they were decent. Because I thought, you know, this may all be terrible. And one of the things I found was that in a lot of places we are celebrating. And my first thought was, whoops, the stereotype is true. We are always partying. And that maybe doesn't seem very serious. But then, I fortunately, I have a book uh, from the Pan-African Music Festival that takes place every two years, uh, uh, every two years in the Republic of Congo. And in that book is an article by a linguist who is also a uh, person from the Bakongo people, that's in Angola, Mozamb uh, Angola, the Congos, Gabon. And his article talked about Congo people in Congo Square in Louisiana. And in French, which was spoken then, there's an expression, fait la bambula. And the bambula, and that's also a dance in many places in the Americas, it is still called bambula. Um, so in French, the expression can mean to party, but it also, spoken by uh, French people disapproving of this African movement and gaiety, means disorder, to create disorder. And there is that kind of expression in many places in the Americas. But in, the, in Kikongo, the language of these Congo people who were dancing in Congo Square, Mula refers to ancestors, and so what they would have been saying using that word was we are dancing so as not to forget our ancestors, not to forget where we come from. And so when you consider that the Afro-Paraguayans with their ethnic name that is the name of an African ethnic group, um, and they're the only group in the Americas with that kind of phenomenon, that they call their music and dance and drums candombe, a Bantu term. They didn't get together with the Afro-Argentinians whose music is tango, the emblematic music and dance of a country that is very proud of its European ancestry, but not so forthcoming. <laughs> About the almost 40% of Africans that were in Buenos Aires in the 19th century. Um, 
they didn't get together and say, hey, what are you going to do to remember? Are you going to dance? Are you going to play drums? No. <laughs> Yet all over the place, we are doing the same kinds of very healthy behaviors as a way of remembering ancestry, remembering where our ancestry came from. So rather than the stereotype of we're just having a good time, it is also a form of historical memory, of preservation of identity. And these folks didn't get together and say, how you all going to do it? The folks on Cat Island in the Bahamas and the folks in McIntyre County in South Carolina, they didn't say, hey, let's dance around in a circle. Let's do a ring shout. They continued that without getting together and deciding that they were going to do the same kind of thing. Um, so what I have found, and this is with respect to the Afro-Turks and the Afro-Indians, they want to be visible. They want to see themselves as part of the larger process. The Afro-Turks, for example, have a, um, the, the calf feast that you saw uh, evidence of. And they want people to come from other places. When I said, oh, I want to come, it's great. Participate in our symposium. Tell us how we are part of this larger African diaspora. So all of these populations want to become more visible, want to assert their identity. Um, the Afro-Indians, for example, some of their, there are at least three totally separate groups of Afro-Indians. And India being a huge country, they didn't all know each other. There was a conference. In 2006, it was just wonderful, uh, not only in making uh, more obvious the African presence in Asia, but also in allowing members of the three major Siddhi groups from uh, Karnataka in the southwest, from Gujarat in the northwest, and from Hyderabad in the east. They got together for the first time ever and got to meet each other, got to see each other. That just wouldn't happen, naturally. They were brought together by the organizers of this conference. And for me, I mean, before that, I thought that it was already quite a bit that I had organized this conference, brought people from places that Encyclopedia Britannica, that was prior to Wiki, Encyclopedia Britannica said that uh, my friend Lucy from Argentina said that she didn't exist, said the two Uruguayans I invited didn't exist. At that point, I didn't know the Bolivian, whose name is Juan Angola Maconde. <laughs> when I met him, he said, I'm Juan Ma uh, Angola Maconde from Bolivia. We have no African culture. I said, Angola Maconde? <laughs> you invented the name? No, there are lots of Angolas, lots of Macondes. No African culture? Give me a break. You saw them dance. <laughs> um, so uh, until I went to India, I, w I was fine in just representing the Americas. Once I went to India, it's like you can't just talk about the Americas anymore. You've got to talk about the whole picture. And there's still more to the picture that I don't know about. So now I've got to go to Australia and get to know the Aborigines first. They are the, 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 the Aboriginal people of Australia represent the first African diaspora when human beings left Africa to begin to populate the world. So they and the people in the uh, highlands of Papua New Guinea are the oldest populations outside of Africa. Now clearly I've got to get to know them. <laughs> so I've got a lot to continue to learn. How did I get involved in this? Well, I went to a, uh, an elite college where I was the last only colored girl in my class. And one of the things that I was told was that Negroes, that's who we were then, had contributed nothing to society. Nothing. Well, I didn't like that. Then I uh, went to graduate school and I read eminent scholars who had studied us who said that we were the only ethnic group in the United States that had no culture. Now, the contradiction was, at the same time, when efforts were being made to convince me that I had no culture, the United States government was using this same allegedly non-existing culture as what was called cultural diplomacy. That's how jazz got globalized, that the, that the government of the United States sent jazz people around the world uh, to spread what was considered most emblematic of United States culture. So. Uh, it's part of my mission to help these other folks around the world to make it clear that they too exist, that their culture is special, that they have um, been globalized in situations that they didn't necessarily choose, but once there, 
they had to do something. They had to recreate themselves. They had to create new cultural forms. They had to. I mean, Africans brought to the Americas, all efforts were made to strip their culture. And they said, oh, okay, well, we've just got to keep being ourselves, so we'll just create these new music, dances, foods, aesthetics, celebrations, because they had to. They had to create new cultural forms. Um, why is this important now? Why, particularly, why is this important in the context of the organization of American states? How are you going to talk about the Americas as the hemisphere if you leave out the majority of the people who created the new societies of the Americas? How are you going to leave out three out of four of, of all the human beings who crossed the Atlantic? Now, we know there was a genocide of the indigenous peoples, okay? So the hemisphere was repopulated. So if you don't talk about the majority of the people, then who, what are you talking about? How are you gonna, it doesn't make any sense. And it's also really important to talk about the commerce in enslaved Africans. I'm not calling my ancestors slaves, and they say there from Martinique talked about the chosification, the thingification of human beings. I refer to the enslaved people um, as a, a condition. These were people who obviously had a lot of will. If they created, the uh, Quilombo de Palmares, right? That existed for 100 years in a colony. Brazil was a colony. These Africans had a free society. Right? Um, so I think that when we think of the story of the Americas, we need to think of the story of all of these, that all these Africans and African descendants created in the Americas. So this is not just an African descendant story. This is a story of everybody. And while I know what my role is, you know, we've heard some institutional roles. My role is just to keep doing the research, to go to these places, to get in the canoes, to go to Playa de Oro, uh, <laughs> which is the top, the, the village at the beginning of the Santiago River, and there is no road, so you have to go in a canoe. And you, be, you may be in the canoe with a refrigerator and a freezer, as well as a whole bunch of other people. So that's my job, to get in the canoe, go to Playa de Oro, show you the gold earrings that that woman had on. I thought they were from Senegal, and she said, oh no, this is gold from Playa de Oro. <laughs> so it was that woman who was panning gold, they find gold, still. So I'm pleased to be here sharing this information with those of you who are here, and I want your help to share the information more broadly with whatever networks you may think of. The film is made now. We're going to do a study guide. And so how do we get it into educational institutions to counteract the kind of education that continues all over the Americas and the rest of the world that does not recognize, to use that first uh, theme of the decade, recognition, that doesn't recognize, the, the, the educational systems that don't recognize the presence, the contributions of all of these African descendants around the world. So how do we get this information out there? I'm uh, thrilled to collaborate and in helping my cousins from the South and the East and the West uh, tell their stories. I had a conference and we did this book that's called African Roots American Cultures, Africa and the Creation of the Americas. So this is just the Americas. This is another one. I lost my mind, did this in Spanish. I had one year of Spanish in a previous century. Conocimiento desde adentro, los afro-suramericanos hablan de sus pueblos y sus historias. Knowledge from the inside. The, this uh, is a collection, the only one in the world, of um, chapters by Spanish-speaking Afro, Afro-South Americans who talk about their own participation in the creation of all of the Spanish-speaking na uh, nations of South America, whether these populations are acknowledged to exist or not. So, uh, so this is the commercial, just so you'll know that if you want follow-up, it's possible. <laughs> so thank you very much, and I look forward to your collaboration. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Walker. Uh, now it's time for you to speak, to question, to raise some issues. I see here Mariette and Kendall, our colleagues and friend, <laughs> friends who helped to put the museum, the United Nations, the Africa diaspora, and the OES together. So I wonder if you'd like to address the floor. I see my friend. I'd like to ask the, pre the people to speak that quote his or her name and institution, if you 
Oh, oh. Okay, so... Okay, yeah. how we'll do it is that the, the right. microphones will be available and on both sides, so you say who you are and pose your question or comment, and you can identify whatever panelist you want to address. Good afternoon, and thank you so much, Dr. Walker. That was an incredible documentary. Uh, it reminded me of some of my travels. I'm Marion Douglas Ungaro, and I'm black American from here, Washington, D.C., um, I worked at the OAS 25 years ago, and uh, first with the uh, OAS Joint OAS UN Human Rights Mission in Haiti, worked here at headquarters, Nicaragua, Peru, and then went to work in the Balkans. But um, I want to ask you, Dr. Walker, one uh, anthropological question. The word barranco, um, the, or I'm sorry, barracoon, barracoon. You're probably familiar with the barracoons in Savannah, Georgia, maybe? There are barracoons in Savannah, Georgia. I was there for a conference three years ago, and these are caves. I can't remember if they were natural or dug out. They're right near the waterfront where they brought the Africans in the second landing after they had stopped and let the sick ones die. The ones that were healthy, they brought to shore and put them into these caves in the wall in Savannah, Georgia. When I looked up the word barracoon uh, in Wikipedia, there was no mention of anything like this in the Americas. And I wondered, I'm a journalist, so I was shocked that it wasn't there at all, and wondering if there are bar barracoons in other parts of the Americas also. Uh, but if you look on the internet, Savannah, Georgia, barracoons, they're there. People, they tour them, but there's no discussion and I, sus I wonder, I, I kind of don't think they're the only ones in the Americas. But anyway, that's not everybody can answer that question. Those are things we have a right to know, the slavery descendants. Um, I had a question about Black History Month here at the OAS for 2018. Um, having worked here, I think I was the only black American, actually. Um, there's a lot of people who, well, nobody mentioned today the fact that what Black History Month started here, Washington, D.C., started by a black American historian, and um, I, there seems to be a disconnect, shall we say, between the OAS and the U.S. community in general, and specifically right here in the District of Columbia. Um, and I guess that'll be it. I actually would like to ask as a follow-up, I founded an organization, Afro-Americas, for the Afro descendants of the Americas, all of us who are the direct descendants of the Africans who were brought to the Americas in the transatlantic slave trade, regardless of which European ship, regardless of where our ancestors were kicked off the boat. And I've heard the number 250 million, a quarter of a billion Afro descendants in the Americas, not 200, but 250 million. And that's a very important thing. We would like to have a meeting here at the OAS, a public meeting, invite the public. There's people from all over the Americas here in the District of Columbia, Washington area, who don't have to travel, for us to start to talk about the recognition, development, and justice issues, um, not just here, but throughout the Americas, but with a population of folks who are here already together. Thanks so much. Yeah. So I'd like to suggest that we get at least three or four interventions in order to boost the audience participation, if you agree. OK? Everybody agrees? So please, if you can quote your name and institution, if you wish. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Secretary. My name is Hilaire Sobers. Um, I am a human rights specialist with the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. I formerly used to work with the rapporteurship on the rights of people of African descent and against racism. And I'm absolutely thrilled to see Dr. Sheila Walker, who was a great friend and continues to be a great friend of the rapporteurship and of the commission generally. Um, and I, I, I have a very short question, which perhaps I'd like to direct to you, Mr. Secretary, and perhaps to Dr. Walker. We are now in a period in the United States um, where one of, the, one of the major issues of the time is racial or, or racialized iconography. And I speak specifically of the question of Confederate statues that are now being challenged, shall I say, um, a 
as memorializing um, essentially uh, 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 the, the degradation and oppression of black people. Now, I'm wondering, the question I have is, to what extent is the OAS prepared to be part of that conversation? And I ask that question in the context of the statue that is outside, Queen Isabella, and I also in terms of the, 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 the person who, who we choose to memorialize in the library, the Columbus Library. So it just seems to me that I'm having a little bit of cognitive dissonance. On the one hand, as an Afro descendant, I'm glad to see that the OAS is on the road to doing some recognition, but I'm also wondering whether the OAS doesn't have some obligation to do some repair, some reparation in terms of its iconography. Um, one final thing, if you look, for example, at the faces, the masks, there's not a single black one. There's no, no, no indigenous, there's no iconography that reflects the contribution of what my, an old professor of mine would call subaltern people. You know, if you look in the whole of the Americas, we celebrate primarily white men. And I just have to wonder at this time, does the OAS have a responsibility? Does there, is there an imperative to engage with this question of what I call reparative iconography? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. You have raised, yeah, Hernando? Okay. okay. Eh, mi nombre es Hernando Viveros y voy a hablar en otra de las lenguas de los afrodescendientes, como dice la doctora Walker. Eh, eh, reconocer y agradecer a la, a la OEA por, por este escenario y también a la doctora Walker por, por siempre estar en, en el marco de la investigación y aportando también a, a los afrodescendientes. ¿no? Eh, sobre todo en el marco del tema de, de reconocimiento, que es uno de los temas del diseño internacional, pero también creo que en este escenario debemos recordar el tema de justicia, de justicia frente al racismo y la discriminación racial que vivimos todos los días los afrodescendientes en las Américas, frente a los asesinatos y la brutalidad policial aquí en Estados Unidos contra los jóvenes eh, afroamericanos, pero también en los otros países de la región. Eh, soy de los que creo que se está practicando un etnocidio constantemente con nuestra población y que es un deber de la OEA en el marco, eh, sobre todo en este escenario que le llamamos la Casa de la Democracia, que pueda eh, interpelar y generar una acción frente a nuestras comunidades. Eh, Creemos también que desde el movimiento eh, afrodescendiente, desde las organizaciones de la sociedad civil, hemos puesto eh, nuestra agenda en este escenario eh, para que lo valide y para que lo respalde, pero vemos que a veces avanzamos tres pasos y luego retrocedemos cinco. Entonces, es necesario construir una agenda conjunta, eh, no solo frente al racismo y la discriminación racial, sino frente a que se generen políticas eh, reales de inclusión. Creo que no podemos seguir denominando que en nuestros países hay o existe democracia mientras exista racismo y discriminación racial. O sea, si miramos en nuestros países, en el marco de la política, cuántos ministros afrodescendientes hay, cuántos jueces de cortes eh, y cuántos afrodescendientes eh, tenemos en posiciones de poderes, es mínimo. Y es lamentable que en 2017 todavía estemos eh, generando esos temas. Eh, como partícipe de la, de la Asamblea General de la OEA eh, en Cancún, realizamos una co coalición del movimiento afrodescendiente y hemos propuesto que para la próxima cumbre de las Américas en Perú, en abril de 2013, se genere un diálogo de alto nivel con los presidentes frente al tema de políticas de inclusión para los afrodescendientes. Y también en el marco eh, del Black History Month, eh, la OEA está creando eh, la Semana de los Afrodescendientes y creemos que debe llamar a un gran foro con los líderes de la región para debatir nuestras cuestiones. Siempre es 
es complejo en la OEA discutir estas cuestiones y yo creo que no son cuestiones mínimas. Creemos, eh, como lo cree el secretario general Almagro, eh, con su lema de más derechos para más gente, eh, creemos que es posible que la OEA pueda tomar un derrotero significativo eh, para nuestra población. Y por último, eh, también quis que quisiera reconocer a la, a la Secretaría de, de Accesos y, y Derechos y Equidad de la OEA eh, el ejercicio que han hecho en el marco del plan de acción de los afrodescendientes. Eh, debemos de velar mucho más por su implementación y cómo esta pueda ser real y eh, decirle que aquí estamos también, o sea, yo soy una persona que hago mucho seguimiento al, al tema de la OEA permanentemente aquí desde sociedad civil y creo que nuestras voces deben de ser escuchadas también. Gracias. Thank you, Hernando. Now we have our friend there. You have the word, please. Iba. So, uh, who is the next one? Ah, okay. Thank you. Um, my name is Thelma Philip Brown, and my ancestors dropped me off in St. Kitts and Nevis, and we didn't before, um, so I don't know whether he asked my question because the English one. So, <laughs> so, um, so I will. But I just want to say thank you so much to the en entire panel. There's an African proverb that says, until the lion tells its tale, the story of the hunt is the hunter's. So I'm so grateful for those of you who continue to tell the tale because when we grew up, the story of the tale was just the hunter's and to a large extent, it still is the hunter's. Um, Dr. Walker, thank you so much. I took three words from that resistance, rhythm, and resilience. And perhaps it's because of the rhythm that we are able to be resilient. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, I, I have one just simple request, or maybe a question. I know that you, the African Union, the ambassador has, they have considered the African diaspora the sixth region and they're interested in getting to know the region and getting database, collecting a database on the per people in the, in the sixth region. So I wonder if it is anyway the OAS, um, the African um, Museum from there, and the African Union could get together for us to try to bring the sixth region together. Okay, thank you. All right, so uh, I'd like to return the word to the panelists and uh, make it free who, whom of you would like to address some final remarks. Perhaps one final remarks of uh, each one, okay? So, Batilde, your final. Okay, so I'll use this one. I wanted to just perhaps uh, reply to a couple of the comments, questions, slash questions that were uh, put forward on the, specifically on the issue of the celebrations that have started at the OAS uh, for Black History Month. Uh, this is a new practice and it, it, it came with a new leadership that we've had since 2015. And, um, and it's interesting, you were sharing that it started in, in Washington DC and it's somewhat has been disconnected from the work that happens here at the OES. But starting in 2016, again this year in 2017, and this is something that we hope to institutionalize later on, we've been having certain events to celebrate Black History Month and connected also to the realities, to the reality of Afrodescendants in the Americas. Um, so there is a discussion among mem member states about uh, also establishing a week of uh, the Inter-American Week for Afro-Descendants, uh, also during the month of February to connect it, of course, to this celebration that happens in, in the country where the OAS headquarters are located. So I just wanted to, to make a comment on that. And um, paso al español para Hernando o... 
en español. <laughs> um, the idea that uh, we can con like continue to rely on civil society to share their input and share their views on the work that the OIS is doing in Afro descendant, uh, the agenda of Afro descendant human rights and social inclusion is very important. We do have at uh, the Secretariat for Access to Rights and Equity a uh, colleague, Catherine Ponyat, I'm not sure if she's still here, that uh, leads the work of the OIS, civil, the civil society participation in OIS activities. And it's very important that we continue to strengthen that participation via the Summit of the Americas as well as the General Assemblies. But we are going to take your word on the plan, the, your support to implement the plan of action, the regional plan of action for the decade and see what other things we could maybe jointly do the OIS as well as civil society institutions. And I also take note of the last comment on this idea of uh, that the African Union has proposed to declare, I guess it would be the term, the African diaspora as the sixth region. There is a history and, 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 and precedent of collaboration, South, South cooperation between the African Union and the OAS. And perhaps it's kind of been dormant for a little while, but perhaps this is a good uh, point that of convergence between both the African Union and uh, the OES, which are both uh, intergovernmental regional organizations. So I, I'm also taking note of that and perhaps we could take on. You have the word, please. So I will respond um, first to the Black History Month question. I do, one of the things that I really did appreciate about this film, I think Sometimes in the United States, when we talk about the African diaspora, when we represent the African diaspora, we really mean black people not in the United States. You know, we're talking about the other black people who exist in the world. And I think this film is one way, you know, that is tying the United States as part of the African diaspora on equal footing with other countries. And I think we can do a better job of doing that during yeah, Black yeah, History Month. So for myself, I'm curator for Latino studies at the National Museum <coughs> of African American History and Culture. And so Afro-Latinidad, is something that I you know, am responsible for infusing throughout the museum, but it's also important to note that we do have two diaspora curators. And I brought up this, um, our first object being this boat seat from Ecuador because I just felt um, that it's a mandate. You know, it was from our director saying, this is how we are framing African-Americanness here in this building. The work that we do is diasporic. It is inclusive, not just in our material collections, but in our programming. And you know, to hear him, I'm sorry? Yes, I am Afro-Latina. <clears throat> um, but our director wants us to be bold, you know? And so when we think about the role of museums, it's not just to be exhibits. It's not just to have public programming around what is physically in our cases. It's to talk about these social justice issues that affect not just African-Americans in the United States, but really reaching out to the diaspora and talking about issues of blackness, period. You know, so Black History Month is certainly one space in which we can do it. But as the National Museum of African American History and Culture, blackness is at the center of what we do. And so I do hope, you know, that you will keep us accountable. We are new. You know, keep us accountable for what we're doing. We are public servants. And so if we're not doing what you think we should be doing, please talk back to us and let us know that. I just want to add a suggestion um, for concerning the Black History Month. Yesterday, we hosted um, a moderated discussion at George Washington University. And one of our partners was ASELA, the organization which I referenced earlier. ASELA is the acronym for um, Association for the Study of African American History and Life. That organization is based right here in DC, housed at Howard University. And it was at the Centennial Conference that Dr. Sheila Walker and I met two years ago. ASELA is the organization that founded Black History Month. And I think that you know, being housed right here in Washington, D.C. makes it very easy for collaboration. And um, Dr. Sheila Walker is also a very active member of that body. So please make good use of her in forming your collaborations. In response to the question about the African Union and its sixth region, I actually love the idea. And, um, at the United Nations, with our program, the African Union has a representative on our committee that works closely with our program, and um, as well as CARICOM, and then the CARICOM member states and the African countries. So those are the countries that have been leading the, um, 
to say, I provide some oversight, I should say, to the mandate that we um, have at the United Nations, um, as I explained earlier. And there were some brochures, I think most of them are gone at the table on our left, at our left. And that is the um, memorial, the permanent memorial that is at the United Nations, which actually came about as a result of a proposal by the African Union and CARICOM to the United Nations that proposed for a memorial to be erected at the United Nations Plaza to honor the victims of slavery and the slave trade. If there are not enough copies here, we can um, certainly get more sent to OAS, and you can also learn more about that um, on our website. And you can certainly speak with me. We do offer tours. We do small group briefings. We encourage teachers to bring their classes. We encourage um, camp counselors during the summer to bring their groups there. And we use it as an opportunity to provide education about the subject matter as well. Thanks very much. Dr. Walker, please. Now we have the, the micro microphones. OK, you don't need the external one. It's working. Okay. Well, this is very exciting. I'm also very excited to see friends from various parts of my life here. So thank you very much. Um, barracoons, no, I, don't, I didn't know about the fact that there were things called barracoons in South Carolina. I'm not shocked. Uh, Savannah, I'm not shocked. I should say also, when I think of Savannah, I think of the monument to the Haitians who helped the United States win the Revolutionary War against colonization. So that reminds me of the role of Haiti in helping how many South American countries become independent? <laughs> yeah, so that's part of the story that we need to know. But I didn't know about the barracoons. I'm not shocked, though. In the, um, the Underground Railroad Museum in Cincinnati, one of the things that's in there is a slave pen from someplace in Kentucky on the other side of the, the, the river. So the K Kentucky was a place of enslavement. Cincinnati was a place of freedom. There was a, a slave pen in Southwest DC also. I beg your pardon? OK. <laughs> so um, I'm not surprised, but I do think that it, I mean, that word, for example, bar barracoon, is used elsewhere in the Americas, interestingly, in Brazil, in, um, in Bahia, at least, in the context of the Afro-Brazilian religion. It's used as the term, the barracão, is the space in which the spiritual beings that you saw come to manifest their presence in the human community. So the words, yeah, uh -huh. but in the tejero, there's the barracão where the dancing takes place. So the word has, has be, been re-signified in this context. But it, really, it is interest, important for us to know about those places of arrival and of stocking human beings as merchandise. Um, which makes me think about the cemeteries, the various cemeteries. There, there's the Uscais do Valongo in Rio, which was call, called the Cementerio dos Negros Novos, I think. So it was Africans who arrived and died. So there's, um, let's see, evidence is coming to the surface. This was, uh, let's see, this area was covered over and then somebody was building a house and found bones, just like the African burial ground in New York. There's the, a similar cemetery in Lagos in the Algarve in Portugal. So these things are coming to light and we just need to know more and we need to share the information more widely. With respect to the ethnocide of the same category of young black males who were the most desirable Africans for enslavers during the period of slavery. I don't know what they were called in English, but they were called piezas uh, piezas de indias, no, piezas de india, uh, who were males between 15 and 25 years old, certain stature, certain weight, who were considered the most desirable human beings to work. Well, now they're the most victimized by cops in the United States and outside of the United States, too. I mean, the United States isn't quite as bad as some of the other countries in the Americas with respect to killing off this demographic. I mean, no, no place is great. <laughs> but, so uh, it's ironic that that was the category of humans that was most sought out to build the Americas. And now that the Americas are built, 
well, we don't need them anymore. Uh, so the cops are taking care of that job. <sighs> I don't know, <laughs> you know, how you folks are gonna resolve this. Um, ASALA, the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. In our discussion yesterday with the executive director, one of the things that we decided is that this was a plotting session. How are we going to raise consciousnesses? How are we going to uh, share information? The Association for the Study of African American Life and History is the oldest black intellectual organization on the planet. It was founded in 1915 when Carter G. Woodson, PhD from Harvard, in, uh, who was one of the first people to write with Du Bois and um, George Washington Williams about African American history. He was so aware that this story was not being taught in the schools, so he organized ways of sharing information with African American teachers. That was his focus, teachers, so that they could teach the story. He wrote a book in uh, 1934 the miseducation of the Negro that is absolutely current. And it's not just the miseducation of the Negro, it's the miseducation of everyone. And what he talked about was the fact that African American history was not properly represented in the educational system. Last week, I was asked to talk to the permanent council. And so I thought, well, I can't represent the Americas. I've got to get words from people in the Americas about themselves. So I wrote to the people in Conocimiento desde adentro. And what I got, the, the responses from the head of the uh, Oro Negro in Chile, the Afro-Chilean, major Afro-Chilean organization, Odeco um, in Honduras, uh, other African descendant organizations in the Americas, Sedet in Peru. What they were saying, one of the, they all said, we organize workshops, we organize classes to teach our story. So what I realized was, just like ASALH, these other organizations, civil society organizations, were organizing workshops and classes to teach against the misinformation that we are force-fed by the compulsory schooling throughout the Americas. Um, so that really shouldn't be the role of civil society. Civil society should benefit from our, from our tax dollars. We should be able to be taught the truth, but that's not happening any place in the Americas. So one of the things that we agreed with respect to ASALA is that every year ASALA has a, uh, a conference at which there are at least 1,000 participants. Many of them are teachers. Uh, there is going to be a panel from now on for the rest of the decade about the decade to raise the consciousness of the, the organization, it's always had an international focus, but I never think it has enough of an international focus. Although if you look at the journal of what was Negro history, now journal of African American history, there have throughout its history been articles about other places in the Americas. The first time I read about the Upilombo de Palmares, it was in the journal of Negro history. And this is from the 1950s. So there has always been this kind of consciousness, but our goal is to further raise the consciousness. With respect to the um, sixth region, now it makes sense to me that the diaspora should be the sixth region. I think that one of the issues is that Africa in general, or Africans in general, are not aware of the presence of Africa around the world. And I had proposed a documentary on how specific areas of Africa are represented elsewhere. I mean, we in the Americas don't think about the influence of East Africa in the Americas. But in the context of, you saw Congada from Minas Gerais in Brazil. Well, one of the, one of the phenomena, uh, yeah, one of the phenomena in the Congada is the meeting of Congos and Mozambiques. So East Africa, we don't think about the East African presence in the Americas, but we should, because it's here. In Colombia, there's a place called Mozambique near Barranquilla. Uh, in um, Mexico, Veracruz Coast, there's a place called Mozambique. I doubt that folks in Mozambique know about <laughs> that. You know, maybe if they did, they'd be more desirous because they would understand the, the, the role of Africa in developing the Americas. And what I think is really important that, uh, and this is within the recognition theme, but I think is fundamental to justice and development. If we don't know who we are, we can't tell anybody. If everybody else doesn't know who we are, that everybody else doesn't know the world of which we're all a part. 
but if you look at the African technologies that built the Americas, if, we're, if we were taught anything about the period of the uh, enslavement of African people, it was that Africans were brought just to do the grunt work, the unskilled labor in the Americas. Now, how much sense does that make? <laughs> you bring 12 million unwilling people from the other side of the ocean because they don't know anything. That's like, I'm going to build a house, and I'm going to have electricity, and I'm going to have plumbing. And oh, the plumber, oh, I'm going to hire an artist to do that. I'm not going to hire somebody who knows. It doesn't make sense, and it isn't true. Europeans knew what Africans dominated what or had knowledge of which technologies. That's why portions of the coast were called the Grain Coast, the Gold Coast. Why? Because that's where people knew gold. So they weren't going to go to the Gold Coast to get somebody to plant rice nor were they going to go to the Rice Coast to get somebody to mine gold. Um, my, one of my favorite statements in that uh, documentary is in Oro Preto, the Portuguese said, the presence of Negros Minas mining Negroes in gold mines brought an almost magical luck. Now, the Portuguese had, been, had had a legitimate trade with the Gold Coast beginning in the mid-1400s. So 50 years later, when they want somebody to come mine the gold that they had suddenly discovered, the gold of the indigenous people, they knew, where, they knew where the Africans knew gold mining. So it wasn't anything about luck. It was all about knowledge of what Africans had expertise. Yeah, the rice in the Americas, rather than Uncle Ben's Carolina rice, that ought to be called Senegambian rice, because that's where it came from. So I think it's really important for us to learn more about and share more knowledge about the transfer of technology from Africa to the Americas, the transfer of systems of knowledge. That's really key. That's great. <laughs> Thank you. Very, very briefly, I wanted to react to a couple of uh, points that you, may, that you made, uh, Dr. Walker. On the issue of um, police abuse, um, I just wanted to flag, and we have a colleague from the commission here, that the special rapporteurship will be producing a special report on uh, police abuse of African Americans in the United States. That's upcoming, and, and you know, he can probably t share with us uh, some more. And then the point on raising awareness, I really like um, your comment about keeping us accountable. Here at the OAS, we have a platform. We have a political platform to share these messages, and we want to make that platform available. And if there's any proposals and opportunities uh, for us to, be this, to, to do this in a more deliberate way, we are uh, more than willing to do. There's initiatives like the, the celebrations led by the Office of the Assistant Secretary General on Black History Month. We've been signing agreements with the institutions who have a, a long trajectory of work in raising awareness on these issues. Recently, we, this year actually, we signed an agreement with Harvard University, the Hutchins Center, and uh, the Secretary General also appointed Dr. Henry Louis Gates as, the, as a goodwill ambassador for the, right, ambassador for the rights of people of, of Afro-descendants. So there's some initiatives that we've been undertaking but we also want to make ourselves accountable. And if there's any, any proposals, any uh, new ideas that we should undertake, we're more than willing to, to take them on. So uh, I'd like to finalize saying that this session was very important for the OES, but most of that for the struggle in two points of the issue. First, to increase the awareness of the contribution of the African people who came to the continent. And second, to increase, to strengthen our struggle to the challenge of inequality, to promote policies which lead to more inclusion of the Afro-descendant populations that are here in the continent. So that's the commitment of the Organization of American States. This session makes all of us more conscious of this commitment, of the task that we face ahead. And it was possible thanks to your film, your studies, your commitment, your, the work that the, the uh, United Nations is doing, that the museum is doing. 
So I'd like to express our gratitude for your coming and the gratitude for your attendance and for the staff of the Organization of American States that made this session possible. Thank you to everybody. Congratulations to you. Ah, Mr. Master Sermon, sorry about that. Thank you very, very much. Are we, are we, okay. Well, thank you very much, panelists. Thank you, Dr. Rands, for leading this discussion, Dr. Walker and the other panelists. Um, a lot has been said. There's a lot to process and um, share in the effort to move from here. So we want to thank you very much for this panel discussion that no doubt we haven't heard the end of these issues, of course, because the journey continues, the discussion continues. But to bring these proceedings to a close, we have the advisor to the Assistant Secretary General who will come up and uh, deliver with us some closing remarks. So to the stage I invite Ms. Kendall Belial. permanent representatives and observers, Dr. Sheila Walker, all of the panelists, a pleasant good afternoon. The more you know your history, the more liberated you are. Those are the words of the late Maya Angelou, a befitting encapsulation of the highlights of this afternoon's premiere screening of a documentary, Familiar Faces, Unexpected Places, a Global African Diaspora and Panel Discussion. The International Decade for People of African Descent, adopted by the UN General Assembly in 2013, is held under the theme, People of African Descent, Recognition, Justice, and Development, implores us to promote respect, protection, and fulfillment of all human rights and fundamental freedoms by people of African descent. This afternoon's film a riveting examination of the African identity in the Americas and places beyond, offered insights into the contributions of the Afro-diaspora to technology, gastronomy, art, religion, and culture. From the game of Wari, a coveted recreational fixture in Antiguan society, to the cultural ceremonies that honor the black kings and queens of the past. These are all shared experiences of the African diaspora, a venerable mix of ancestral traditions that can be traced back to their African origins and have withstood the test of time. We also saw the strong presence of spirituality and religion within Afro societies and even outside of our hemisphere in places like India, Turkey, and the South Pacific. Even in our hemisphere, the video showed that we find African descendants living in parts of South America, namely Argentina, Bolivia, Ecuador, Uruguay, places not typically considered of Afro heritage. We also find Afro descendants in Palenque, Colombia, a former stronghold and place of refuge for escaped slaves. We cannot forget Brazil, home to the largest black population outside of Africa, hosting the world's most, populous, most popular carnival, a boisterous manifestation of African culture as revelers danced to the samba beat. Today we heard from the representatives of the OAS, the UN, the National Museum of African American History and Culture, on how they are contributing to the international decade for people of African descent and promoting the advancement and recognition of Afro societies across our hemisphere. This afternoon's enriching discussion centered on Afro descendants, not as oppressed and marginalized, but as pioneers and luminaries. But it also demonstrated many of the concerns that persons of African descent share with respect to how far we have come or not come in terms of addressing political and economic challenges, challenges facing Afro populations. Indeed, there remains many challenges, but we believe that the will and opportunities exist to rectify these issues. The OAS, for its part, is seeking to play a role in these discussions. Actually, in 2002, the OAS Permanent Council convened a special meeting to bring together the permanent representatives and observers to the OAS and the Washington-based representatives of the African countries to discuss collaboration in key areas. We continue to build on these initiatives as we go forward. I would like to 
take this opportunity to, to thank our partners, Ms. Omaima David of the UN, who was very instrumental in organizing this event. Um, Mr. Maurice Arant, our moderator for the afternoon, um, Dr. Bitola Munoz, and Dr. Ar Ariana Cortez of the National Museum of African American History and Culture. We appreciate the dedication and commitment to promoting the rights of persons of African descent. Last but certainly not least, I extend a heartfelt thank you to Dr. Sheila Walker for sharing with us today this premiere of your film that has undoubtedly enlightened and inspired all of us. May you continue to educate and share with the world your discoveries. I wish to thank the Assistant Secretary General of the OAS, Mr. Mendez, his Chief of Staff, Ms. Lila Prince, and all the staff of the office who helped to prepare um, this event. As we end today's discussions, I thank you for attending, and I hope that you leave with a renewed understanding of the rich and the rich cultural identity of the Americas and an enhanced appreciation of the ties that bind us rather than the walls that divide us. I leave you with one final quote from Maya Angelou. We are braver and wiser because they existed, those strong women and strong men. We are who we are because they were who they were. It is wise to know where you come from, who calls your name. I thank you. Okay, so we're formally closed now, but we want to just again thank all the panelists, thank everyone, thank the Office of the Assistant Secretary General, and of course our um, participants, attendees, everyone who made it here. And of course this is the beginning of another phase of the sharing the, the, the good word that has been shared here. And one of the things that struck me in Dr. Walker's presentation was that, um, you know, people who thought, we, we know different things in compartmentalized things, but when you see, you know, for instance, someone mentioned this phenomenon in South Carolina, is it? And uh, many of us had not known of this before. And so, Savannah, Georgia, rather. And so the more we share these experiences, and exchange notes, the more knowledge is built and uh, the more we become aware, because awareness, as the Brazilians would call it, consciencia, consciencia, con, yeah. <laughs> so, so this has been a wonderful session. I really appreciate the opportunity. I must also thank those who actually helped us hear one another, those who have the technicians who helped not just to record, but to provide the microphones. We have to thank everyone who provided services here. And so we go away from here with a renewed resolve and, I hope, interest in really doing our individual and collective part in making um, these things known. Just one little note to address the matter of iconography, just, you know, the OAS itself has done, or let's say in the last few years, has seen some, some move in this. We appreciate that these things are slow. Just earlier this year, was it earlier this year? Yes. Another bust was installed in the Hall of Heroes, representing another Caribbean um, hero, that of the Bahamian former prime minister. So, you know, these may be considered baby steps, but it does show that we're still moving in a certain direction in creating representation and representivity. So just wanted to make that note. So again, thank everyone for being here. <laughs>